uh, uh, something from literature to start us off? Yes, with? I do. Oh, Mark, I do. Wait, have wait. Oh, excuse me, David. Just, just yeah. a second. Gail, Gail wanted to say something else. I, I ran across something, a, a very short quote the other day that I think should be read to us. Most Jews can be said to stand for certain ideas and attitudes, a particular concept of morality, a reverence for law founded on the idea of truth, a penchant for asking nettlesome questions, skepticism toward would-be saviors, and a liberal passion for freedom, which I think is very appropriate for right now. Yes, I, I, I think so, you. too. And who, who's that from? I'm sorry. You know, I, I've lost my reference, and I, I'll find it, but I don't have it right now. Sorry. Okay. But it is a beautiful quote, Gail. It is. It's a very important one. Uh, it, it's sort of going to dovetail a little bit into today's discussion. So keep that in mind. You may want to repeat it uh, a little later, too. David, I, I'm going to give you the floor. I know we're okay, starting a little you. early. But we have and a lot to a, cover today. This uh, is a nice short little poem by Robert Frost. I think if you've looked out in the sky these evenings, you see a very bright star in the south. That is Sirius, the dog star of Canis Major. And um, Frost wrote a poem called Canis Major. The great overdog, that heavenly beast with a star in one eye, gives a leap in the east. He dances upright all the way to the west and never once drops on his four feet to rest. I'm a poor underdog, but tonight I will bark with the great overdog that roams through the dark. Thank you. That's good, very nice, thank you. I, thank have, you. Uh, I have something for you. Sure. Uh, I don't know who's, who this is, oh, I think this is from Thomas Jefferson. I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. Thank you. Mm. That's very, very good. Very, very interesting. Thomas Jefferson, I want to hear. It's fascinating. Well, any other any other uh, uh, readings or things to before has we her hand up. Helene has her hand up, yes. Okay. She's muted. Oh, now she's not. I have one. Are you ready? Always, yes, please. Always remember you are braver than you think, stronger than you, than you seem, and loved much more than you'll ever know. Mm. Excellent. That's beautiful. And who said that? I have no idea. It was sent to me. <laughs> Oh, it doesn't it's matter. Nice. It's still beautiful. Any other? Just, any I'm just other? Thrilled that a lot of the others are starting to make little quotes too. I any guess other quotations. Yes, Pastor Bruce. This kind of goes along with Thomas Jefferson over there. I wrote this down from something this morning. Um, Charlene Green said it. Don't lead your life from the past. <laughs> <laughs> don't lead your life from the past. Re you can remember the past, but you can't necessarily lead your life from the past. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. That kind of went with that Thomas Jefferson thing, and I went, didn't I just hear that earlier today? <laughs> well, we're going to be covering all of this material. All of this happens to be extremely important in what we're about to read. So before we get started, I'm going to uh, uh, read our, our prayer in English. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of the universe. You have sanctified us through your commandments and commanded us to busy ourselves in things of Torah. Amen. Amen. This is it. And this is going to be a phrase, a, 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 a verse just one verse in Torah that we're going to spend a lot of time with because it dove, everything that, that was, has been read dovetails into this one verse. Oh. Okay, 
because it is read very quickly in, in Orthodox services. Come, it is not read in Aramaic versions of the, of the Torah at all. It doesn't appear. And it is, uh, and uh, discussion about it is, as in German, verboten. But we're going to talk about it because there are some major lessons to be learned from this one verse. And so if somebody would care to read only verse, uh, uh, it should be Genesis 35, verse 22. I ha okay, I, I, I have hands raised, uh, uh, and uh, why don't we, uh, 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 are you, you're muted, Grace? You'll have to unmute yourself, Grace. Well, let us hear you, Grace. I, I, I wasn't, I didn't raise my hand, I was. Oh, I I'm sorry. I was okay, David. Sorry. So. Okay, no problem. Verse 22, and it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel, formerly Jacob, heard of it. Okay. So we're going to enter into a, a discussion. Uh, those of you who have the Hebrew in front of you, it is very common, very common, to have the symbol pe or pe after or pe it's pronounced it can be pronounced pe and in, by some it's pronounced fe or fe okay and it it usually it comes at the end of a series of verses like it, it's denoting a paragraph but here in this, it is dead center of this comment of this verse. So it's like it, it's it's unusual to have this, and I don't know if this is the only place in Torah, but so far we have not seen this. So it becomes a very interesting uh, discussion. Those of you who remember Yiddish, what, first, what does pe or fe mean? Uh. Disgusting, that's right. You don't want to talk about it. it. It's disgusting. It's something bad. Okay, it's a Shonda. Yeah. Okay. If we just do not want to discuss it. But what does pe mean in Hebrew? Mouth. Mouth? Mouth. Okay. So, you know, so, something that deals with the mouth. Not, I didn't say mouse, <laughs> for those of you who have hearing difficulties. So, uh, I, 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 so it becomes, it, you can remember, uh, some of you may remember your grandmother or even your mother, just saying, just saying, pe, 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 or fe, fe, fe. You know, if, uh, if the, especially if there was gossip, okay, or talking, you know, uh, it, 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 anything that came from the mouth that was, could go either way. And uh, rabbis and and uh, in in the Chabadniks talk about this uh, that the mouth the, the the mouth can say things and speech is an action that it can that it can sway people's minds it can lead to very bad things. Well, those of you who heard Gail speak earlier, uh, yeah. It can, uh, it can sort of become uh, uh, inciting. 
uh, it can uh, speak harshly of others, but the mouth can also uh, do as diplomats do, speak with tact. It can be uh, as rabbis and, and ministers uh, uh, and imams, they can talk about it from the standpoint of doing, you know, what can we learn from things? And we're going to try to take that approach with today's discussion. What do we learn from this one uh, verse or phrase or sentence? Uh, Marty, Marty, where are we? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. We were talking about verse, uh, chapter uh, Genesis 35, verse 22. Thank you. Sorry. You're welcome. And we were talking about uh, the letter pe and what it can mean. I, I really am happy that you're with us because uh, it, uh, there's so much written about this one verse uh, and it isn't usually discussed. So, so let, let's, let's uh, talk about this. What are the, the aspects of this uh, I found a, uh, a very interesting uh, 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 commentary here, uh, and we ought to, we ought to reread it, read this, because the, the title of the commentary by Dr. Tsoreff, I do not know if uh, Dr. Tsoreff is, is a rabbi or a professor, or, 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 or who he is, but it's very interesting. Uh, did Reuben lie with Bilha? Yes, no, we don't talk about it. And it, it deals with Reuben's sin and its consequences in the Torah and all of the different Midrash uh, that, that follows. So, what are your what are your takes just from what is written? Verse twenty two, and if we, if it it's needs written. to be reread, just say so, uh, and we will, uh, you know, we will uh, talk about it because you're going to hear this addressed multiple times in Torah. Okay. Yes, uh, is, is it Grace? Yes, Grace, your hand is up. Okay, so I've read a few of the commentaries and I was thinking, you know, maybe there's some balance in between where Reuben may be somewhat replicating what has happened to other men in the clan where they've slept with multiple women, or is he actually a rebellious youth? Where, you know, is he doing what he's been seeing going on? Or is he actually being a bit of a rebellion, you know, a rebellious? That, and in what way is he rebelling? Um, is he, one of the commentaries. He took, his yeah. comp concubine. he took his father's concubine as his own. Okay. And what is symbolic in that? I don't know. I'm here to learn. Oh, wise guy. <laughs> you opened the door. A any comments from anyone? That's the police. Well, in that time, if somebody slept with the, uh, uh, let's put it this way, his mother or his uh, father's concubine, he was considered uh, making a statement of supremacy. Oh. That oh. he was, and, and he, I had to learn all of this. So uh, it, it, it's in this discussion uh, by Dr. Sorif. Uh, and he, and in, in doing this, it's saying that he is the rightful heir, okay? What is it called? Primogenitor? Primogenitor. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, that he is the firstborn and therefore he is 
uh, entitled to 50% of uh, whatever is owned by his father. All the other brothers will divide up the rest. But Marty. Sorry. Yes, please. Marty. Lee, there are other interpretations here. Well, this isn't a matter of interpretation. This is a matter of what happens to Reuben later on. He gets demoted from this birthright. Exactly. Because, quote, he ascended his father's bed. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. It's a rather interesting term, but mm -hmm. ascended his father's bed. So he gets punished for this, but not for a few more chapters, which means six months from now for us. But... <laughs> That's <laughs> correct. We'll forget by then. And it becomes, uh, uh, it, in, in uh, I forget if it's in mentioned, but where it's mentioned, I think it's Deuteronomy that uh, as one of the commandments, we're not uh, supposed to, to do this. Okay. Yeah. So, if, so from my standpoint, I would say, peh, 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 just like your grandmother or grandfather used to say when it was discussed like this. It's disgusting. And, uh, and so uh, we ha have to talk about that because on Jacob's deathbed, as, as you are uh, rightfully stating, Gail, this is a subject that we're going to re uh, you know, come to it again. And I'm sure we're going to discuss this as well. As a matter of fact, if we read through the stories in, in Torah, uh, the, one, uh, the Reuben clan, uh, uh, the Ru if you will, the Reubenites, <laughs> uh, they are, um, they're a rebellious sort and they're going to challenge Moses. Interesting. Gail, I think I know. I I, no, I don't know if you're raising your hand. No, no I'm reaching for a pencil. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, <laughs> oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> it becomes very interesting. So, any comments about what I've just mentioned? We sort of covered the waterfront on on this. Larry and Donald have their hands up, Marty. Okay, let me let me change my, uh, the the uh, screen the view that I have because I can't see everyone. Uh, Larry had his hand up, and Donald had his hand up. Okay, so Larry, let me uh, address you. For, uh, now I, I can see everyone. Uh, so uh, Larry, why don't you uh, have have your say, and then uh, Don? Okay, looking through all my books, I found the most complete um, commentary by Hertz on this. Um, he said, it was the practice among Eastern heir of parents to take possession of their father's wives as an insertion, assertion of their right to succession. But whatever the reason, the memory of this repulsive incident lingered in the patriarch's mind. It influenced the, in quote, blessings, which on his deathbed, he imparted to his eldest son. So I think that um, elaborates on all the previous comments. That's right. Who, by the way, on, on Jacob's death, uh, deathbed, who does he give the double portion instead of the son? In, you know, instead of Reuben, who receives that? Uh, Yosef. Uh, oh, uh, uh, yes. Yosef, Yosef gets two because he has two sons. Right. And they get. That's right. So, it, so you see how these stories will tie, continue to tie together in different ways in Torah. You, you remember in years past, I always have spoken about threads. And this is a thread that is going to come up several more times in our discussion, and we'll be readdressing this. Well, if you say that, you know, this is a horrible situation, what happens, what good comes out of this? Mm 
Well, in Torah, the commandment, okay, thou shalt not, a son shall not lie with his mother or the concubine of his father. So the, the mitzvah is good. And so it becomes a, it, it becomes a very, uh, so you can see that there's a balance here. Yes, Gail. I'm wondering if that's the commandment you're talking about, or is it the one that refers to, not to covet? I'm, I'm no, 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 this is very specific. No, they, they, we have to remember that commandments are all over the place. There are 613. Right. So it's not about just the 10 commandments. But if we think about it, he is lying with his aunt. Because Bila is the mother of one of his brothers. Correct. Y yes, Don. Actually, I think Bruce was in front of me. No, I, I called on you and Larry because <laughs> I saw your hands up. Okay. I was just trying to I, I, I changed the, the uh, I, my what I had before uh, was not a, a good format. So now I can see most of the people here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm up here on the International Space Station, as you can see. <laughs> um, but um, that that scenario with Reuben and Jacob, it, it's it's the classic um, Oedipal triangulation. You know, it's mm -hmm. the basis of of um, Shakespearean tragedy and, and Freud's work and except it's a little not quite as severe because it's not Rebecca, it's the concubine. But uh, the, the point I was going to make is that that uh, Jacob had just buried Rebecca. That so, is correct. Very so, good. So the tension is enhanced, I think. Um, and so now Jacob's buried his wife. It doesn't say how long the gap was between when Rebecca died and when uh, Jacob slept with a concubine. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, stronger than if, um, well, I don't know if it's stronger if Rebecca was still alive. That makes it, even more complicated because now you have a wife and a concubine. <clears throat> but anyway, all my point was that it's a really a classic situation that's kind of come down through the ages. And yeah, it's, well, it's it was magnified by Freud. Yeah, yeah. You know that it, it's it's very Freudian in its its description, and uh, and so here you have a situation that uh, uh, you know Freud was Jewish. He knew he knew about Torah, and uh, he may have gotten some of his ideas this way. I don't know. It is, I don't think he mentions that, but I uh, but I think it's very interesting uh, that uh, a son has to uh, go through this phase, uh, and women go through it too. They, they, they have the Electra complex uh, where they uh, they want to uh, uh, marry their father and displace the mother. Uh, all, all, all kids go through this to a s slight extent, but, but what happens is they have to learn to control it. <laughs> they have to learn to control it. Otherwise they run into some difficulties. I have to say something. Yes, Helene. Children <clears throat> fall in love with the father, the, the girl falls, they fall in love, they have to. They're just tiny. They just adore yeah. their father or the boy adores the mother. But the child does not yet, uh, the, the wish and the deed are, are so, the wish is there, the deed may be later. Very but correct. That's what, that's what I was getting after. I, I have to disagree. I, you're painting a very broad brush where you say all children go through this. Not true. I certainly did not ever feel that way about my father at oh, any excuse age. Excuse me. Oh, I didn't mean to sleep. God forbid. No, but you, no, no, no. You said all children fall in love with, and that's not true. I, but I, you, 
wait a second, what does falling in love mean to you? I mean, a child loves her father. A girl loves her father. She wants the hugs, but she doesn't want to sleep with her. She doesn't Correct. even know. No, I, I never admired my father in okay. any affectionate way at all, period. I, be, I of, believe that. End of story. I believe that you're not all, you're right, and I apologize. Not all children fall in love with their fathers or mothers, but the, but the majority of children, research shows, they do. And then they grow out of it. If, and if they have it, it entitles them to have a relationship with the, uh, the opposite sex. But then it's comfortable. If you never had it, it's not comfortable for you to have a relationship with the opposite success. So I'm, you're right. All children do not. The majority of children, if you watch them, cling to their opposite sex parent for a long time, and then they grow out of it. It, it, would it be better to say adore? Yes, I love that. Thank you. That, that, yes, uh, yes. You know, it, it, for, for one reason or another. Uh, but I think the, uh, uh, you know, the majority of psychologists and psychiatrists would say that, what you just mentioned, Helene. So Freud has gone, you know, and, and Jung, they, they've gone, taken this in many different directions. But the, the point is that when we understand what goes on, uh, the majority of these have to be sure that they limit, that they, that they contain that emotion because challenging the opposite, you know, this, the parent of the same sex, that, that's wrong. That's you know, just wrong. Uh, yeah, Marty, uh, yeah. Uh, the, that word adore is... Uh, is really a perfect word. And then there are steps that, t that take place from there. And that is a door now turns into respect yes, at a yes. later date. And then it turns into honor, where you're supposed to honor your mother and father. That's a, a very, very good very point, point, Michael. Very good point. Uh, yes, Rabbi Mary. I was trying not to say it, but I can't. It was that, you know, most of the case of children and uh, daughters and fathers having sex, it's initiated by the fathers and not by the daughters. And we call it sexual abuse. So I <laughs> just, uh, oh. the issue of coveting. Interesting. Uh, it, it's not interesting. It's, it's terrible, but <laughs> but that's the direction that it goes. And that's an interesting direction that Freud did not talk about because he was a patriarch. Uh, but that's it. I won't continue. <laughs> Any other comments? Yes, uh, Pastor Bruce. And then back to Larry. Okay. Yeah, I, quite a while ago, we talked about... Um, this idea that it was a declaration of rebellion to do mm -hmm. this. I, I can't remember how far back that was now. <laughs> um, and it seems like most of sin in our world is happening when someone sets themselves up above someone else. Mm -hmm. Is that, would you all agree with me on that? Yes. Yes. Somebody is yes. setting themselves yes. up above someone else and so when you do that and then you move forward with that thought that you are better or superior or have the right to whatever it is then the action from that 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 thought then to the feeling then to the action turns into sin yeah and so I, I just, I'm, th I was, I was, I've been contemplating this for quite some time since we talked about that. I just, yeah, just coming, just coming back to that, and you know, the reference in um, Genesis 49, of course, goes goes back to this 35, and there's a couple of other passages that are listed in the commentary that I'm reading from, which is the, um, you know, the Jewish Study Bible, 
And it goes to 2 Samuel 16 and 1 Kings 2 as references as well. Um, but it's interesting because I don't know the Midrash as well as you all do. But it says that some some people have have denied this literally taking place. And I don't know anything about, and I can hardly read it. Is it Shab in the Midrash? I, I'm Shab, not sure, I, but go ahead. Okay, anyway, it's, um, it's, it says that it's really not to be taken literally, or it is, they deny that it's taken literally or something sure. to that effect. I, and so anyway. That just I shows just, that it's bad. Yeah, so anyway, I was just thought, well, I, it's in several places that I just kind of think, well, I don't, I don't know if you can deny that it really took place or didn't take place, but the way it's worded, it's, I just found it interesting that that was a part of the commentary. So I don't know what y'all think about that because I'm thinking it either happened or it didn't happen. I, I mean, it's one or one or the other. <laughs> That's why the title of this particular commentary. Oh, really? uh, but, but I think it's very important. Yes, uh, before we do that, I, I want to recognize uh, Larry because he had his hand up for a long time now. Okay, two things. First, um, follow up on Pastor Bruce's comment about one people feeling superior to another. That is in essence the caste system. And I highly recommend the book Caste by yes. Isabel Wilkerson. Yes, um, excellent. It is profound and beautifully written. But back to our topic of the day, um, that this is from Robert Alter's com commentary. Uh, the Talmud saw in the story an intention on the part of Reuben to defile the slave girl of his mother's dead rival, Rachel, and so to make her sexually taboo to Jacob. Most recent commentators have observed with justice that in the biblical world, cohabitation with the consort of a ruler is a way to make him claim to his authority. And when the usurper um, Absalom cohabits with his father David's um, concubines. And so Reuben would be attempting to seize um, in the father's lifetime his firstborn rights to the head of the clan. So more background. And that opens another discussion. If we try to put ourselves into the head of Reuben, what has taken place that may have given Reuben the idea that he could or should take action like this? It just doesn't come out of the blue one day. So we have to say, what, what could he have been think, seeing? What he, could he have experienced? that may have, have led him to do this er erroneously. Yes, uh, Don. Um, I don't really have an answer, but I, I, just to extend your question is, um, did Reuben seduce her or did he overpower her? It doesn't or, say. It doesn't say. So we don't know really what, this, what happened. Um, That's right. And so, um, yeah, it just, it just happened. That's all we know. And so any judgment will have to come from whatever morals or mores that we observe today. Yeah. Gail? I don't, yes, Don. I don't think a concubine would have any say in the matter one way or the other. Right. She's just property. Right. Well, do we, do we know that? Yes, at that time, Gail is correct. At that time, women were considered property. Um, does, does that make it any simpler? I guess the question. Well, I'm that's one of the before. explanations. Yeah. I mean, that's one way to, over, to try to simplify it and get rid of the problem. But, um, but property or not, they're still human beings. But if, and, but if he's seizing property, Mm -hmm. Okay, he's seizing his his father's concubine, and he's his he's claiming his right to lead. Mm. Okay, 
That's so, so basically, we can consider it as he um, he he stole Jacob's amulets, or ah, yeah, stole. well, yeah, um, he, that's right. That's yeah, yeah, if you will, a uh, Suzanne and then Helene. Uh, Suzanne, you have to I got it. I got it. I okay. <laughs> Anyways, I have um this uh book that was translated uh these testimonies I guess we'll call them from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Oh, the testaments of the patriarchs. Um <clears throat> and uh in it uh now this is obviously this is is not in the bible so mm -hmm. um well anyways it 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 says that he was i guess talking to his kids and and uh talking about the sin that he had committed with bill haw and <clears throat> what he says in his testimony was that <clears throat> He, uh, he saw her bathing in a private place and otherwise he would not have committed the sin and that he could not stop seeing her nakedness in his mind. He couldn't sleep, so he just had to have her. So when Jacob and Isaac went away and uh, we were at Gadar, or Gadar near Bethlehem Ephrathah, <laughs> Bil Bilhah was drunk and asleep naked in her tent. And then he went in her tent and uh, and uh, committed the sin and he, and he left her there. Now he says that an angel of God revealed his sin to his father. And, um, and that was how his father Jacob found out. Is this from the the book of Reuben? It sounds uh, like it. Well, I don't know if you call it a book of, of Reuben. It, it, the chapter is titled Testament of Reuben. Testament. Okay, same thing. Same thing. And it's, and, uh, yeah, and he was saying that, um, you know, not to be taken in by beautiful women and don't get in, involved. And when you when the Lord gives you your wife, he wants you to have, then, you know, stay with her and, and all that sort of stuff. So if, if this is the case, does this remind you of any other story that we, we spent some time discussing uh, maybe six months ago? <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, what comes to mind, and I don't know if this is what you're looking for, Marty, but um who was it? Uh, somebody lost their wife, and then he he had a sex with his daughter-in-law, although he did not realize it at the time. Oh, that comes later. That that we haven't read yet. Oh, we all gone, right. We haven't gone into the discussion about Tamar. That'll be in a few that's weeks. That's it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. But uh, what about Noah? Oh, about when, when the sons. Yes. Anyone? Any others? Pa Pastor Bruce, you you were. I was I was thinking about. Uh, well, Noah was one of the ones I was thinking about in this case. Also, yeah, just sleeping with someone who was yeah. <laughs> okay, Mary. Yes, please. Well, uh, Noah is a completely different background of what's happening here. Uh, because uh, after the destruction of Sodom, Sodom and Amorah, the, the family thinks that the world has been destroyed and only the three of them survive. So they give the father wine and they have sex with the father. Yes. With a background of saving humanity. I know it's mm. wrong, they knew it's wrong, that's why they have to give him wine, but the reason was saving humanity. Right. So, so th this is, uh, you know, when we talk about these things, 
sometimes we will say, well, it's not, it's not correct. But maybe for the continuation of the story, our story, it becomes necessary. I don't know the correct answer. We can, yes, Rabbi Mary again. <clears throat> I want to, uh, to comment with Donald, who's asking a very important question. Uh, did she give consent? And as you said, today we deal with that nonsense, excuse me, did she give consent or not? Um, that's regardless of the act, he should not have have sex with his aunt. Uh, so that, that's one thing. Uh, the others are coming up, we have not gone through them, but we have, and you'll remember this, the story of Dina. And it's a, it's a horrible, horrible story. And, and there is the question, Donald, if she was in love with that king that something happens to him, or he forced himself on her. So that's a question that's going to come again. And uh, the Talmud does something very interesting regarding rape versus not rape. And they say, if it happens in a field that no one else is there, and she shouts and no one comes to help her, then we'll believe her. But if it happens in the city and she does not scream, help, help, then, uh, no, the opposite. And when she asks for help, we cannot believe her because there are a lot of people around that could help her. So uh, the, the rabbis dealt with that question, which I think is fascinating how things happen. Um, the issue of consent that comes up these days or what uh, Suzanne brought up, oh, she was bathing and she was naked and I couldn't content myself. So that's another thing. And on that story, we're going to meet with King David. Right. That's so Bathsheba bathing on the roof and it could not contain himself. So um, these are themes that come by and, and we see them today as well. Finish. Very good point. We're even going to readdress this uh, uh, probably in a month or so uh, up when, with regard to Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Okay. Right, right. She so, wants to seduce him. That's right. But, but he rejects that for a higher reason. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Don, you had your hand up. Yes. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> it seems to me there's a clear distinction between relationships involving somebody else's wife. I mean, that's clearly forbidden sure. commandments. <clears throat> but then there's a gray area between um, concubines and polygamy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, polygamy was practiced in the United States until a few decades ago, um, and uh, quite openly. And yet, because of the, the legal constraints, it wasn't, con they were legally wives, they weren't concubines. Sure. sure. But that's only a legal distinction. I mean, the fact is, yeah. um, I mean, the, the same scenario goes back thousands of years. Okay. It's, 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 a, it's, the, it's an important point. Yes. Uh, Rabbi Mary again. Uh, the concubine was as, like a wife and uh, her sons have the same right. She might not, but her sons have the same right than the wife. Now, regarding polygamy, polygamy it ended very, very late with the Rambam saying, no, 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 you cannot have that. Uh, so in Judaism, that's the point that uh, it was forbidden. And in the biblical time, uh, 
personally, Donald, I don't regard it <laughs> history. Uh, but the time they did what anyone else did around them. And many women and many maids and many concubines, the more the better. But, but if you did have many wives and concubines, there was one other condition that had to be met and that was wealth, power. And, and that would, they had to be able to support them. They had to be able to support the children and the children were not really considered the way we consider children today. They were property, they, anything could be done to the child. The more children you had, the more workers you had in the field, the more children could work in the factories. They could help provide for the household. Mm -hmm. It's only a very recent history, uh, going back to the, uh, uh, the 19th century, that things start to change. But it was a strong consideration about children uh, that they were, they were property. And so uh, you had to be someone of wealth if you could support all of that. Or you lived in abject poverty if you had multiple children and could not support them. We are going to be talking could, very shortly. Could the children, Amadi, could the children have been sold? Yes. Yes, they could. They could be sold into slavery. Well, so, not in our tradition. No, not, not in, in our, our tradition. And this is, leads to another discussion. Uh, I've been reading a book called The Great Partnership. Uh, okay. And it is written by Rabbi Sachs. You know, I, I frequently bring Rabbi Sachs into, into some of our discussions. And there's something different about Judaism. Okay, and I'm going to first preface what I'm going to read. Uh, children are thought of differently in Torah. What do some of the wives have to do in order to get children? What does Sarah have to do? She has to pray. Because and I have a concubine. She, and have a maiden. You could do that, but also uh, she prays. She prays that uh, she's doing something that is politically correct. Okay, at that time, in that day and time, a concubine can be a substitute. But she prays because she wants to be relieved of her barrenness. And she is given a gift from God that, he, that God says, you will have a child. And the same thing is going to happen to Rebecca. She's giving, you know, she becomes barren and she has to utilize her her made servants as concubines for Jacob. But she too That's prayed. That's Rachel. Rachel. Rachel is there. Rachel, right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, but, but she too is doing that. So in Judaism, just like the land is a gift from God, children are a gift from God. Totally different, totally different take on what happens in the Islamic world, what happens in other, other areas of regions of the world, uh, even early Christianity. 
it is not, it, 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 the children are considered property. And anything can be done, but, but in Judaism, over, over, as time goes on, children are considered as a gift from God. I was going to read something out of, out of this book, but I sort of summarized his take on things. Isn't it, uh, Marty, isn't that considered in Judaism still today? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's still considered today uh, that children are a gift from God. Yes. And you have so many Jewish women that are willing to do what they do. I don't want to get political, but... Uh, if you know what I'm driving at, because I'm not going to mention anything other than that, that so many Jewish women are willing to do what they do today, uh, knowing that. Uh, and that's so, I mean, I can open a whole thing, but but that's that's as far as I'm going to go. So that is a very um, a traditional way of, of speaking. Let me put it that way. Uh, it, uh, uh, there are other ways that we would think about things today uh, uh, with regard to uh, uh, women's rights and, and so forth. I, I don't, I, I, as you said, I don't want to go into the political ramifications, but the, these are things that have been uh, discussed in other circles and, and other cir debated in other circumstances. Uh, and uh, it's good to know both sides. Let me put it that way. It's good to know both sides. Yes, Pastor Bruce. I was just gonna say in our discussion of the prayers, um, the example that I look at um, in the, the Tanakh and is Hannah to me is one of the, the ones that truly so desires to have a child. You mean Hannah? Do you mean Hannah? Hannah. Hannah, yes. Hannah yeah. that has yeah. Samuel? Yes. Yeah, Hannah. Yes. Yeah. And she, she's the one that um, really, to me, exemplifies that, that deepest desire and has the emphasis of prayer for such things that are that are recorded anyway uh, for us to see, and um, I just we were talking about the the you brought in the idea of praying and that Sarah prayed and Hannah to me is a great example of that in the scripture um, mm -hmm. of someone who really desired to have a child and and I wasn't sure exactly what you were referring to in early Christianity but I do know that. As, as a Christian that we certainly do believe that every child is a gift of God, <laughs> certainly. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, now, I don't know about back no, then. But, but, but this, is, this is something that uh, it, it, it's, I, I think, it, 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 I know it's gonna open up a lot of discussion, but it is something that uh, it, it's more of a traditional approach now going back to the 1800s, especially, uh, and, be and before, a little bit before, in, in many of the religions, many religions, uh, but today there are different uh, pressures in society and we have to acknowledge those differences of, of things. So, so that's, that's why I say, now I know Larry had his hand up and Rabbi Mary had her hand up so, Larry, I'm going to let you, I, I don't know who is first, but... Uh, okay. Okay. Earlier in Genesis, we came across the binding of Isaac, and Abraham did not argue with God. If he truly valued his child as a gift from God, um, he gave up too easily in following um, God's will, shall I say. I found... Uh, an, an interesting discussion about that from the from another perspective that uh, that if he if a child is recognized as a gift from God could that have been an act of return if God wanted the child back that that 
Abraham was uh, going along with that idea. I don't know, but it, but we can argue. You know, that, that's the beauty of Torah that we can we can discuss both both sides or multiple sides, and we have to be aware of that. Uh, your take is more modern. Okay, that's all I can say. Yes, okay. Rabbi Mary. Um, I'm going to comment on what Bruce said, that uh, Hannah is the prototype of what you say, praying to God to get a child. And we read this during the holidays, the high holidays, we read that parasha. Now, when she does give birth, she gives, she gives the child to work in the temple with Samuel. No, there's no temple. To work for God to become a prophet, and he is the first prophet. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to share with you regarding the importance of the children today in Judaism is that if a couple cannot conceive for 10 years, that's a reason by the rabbis to give a get, to divorce them. So the husband can come to the rabbis and say, look, you know, 10 years I lived with this woman and I don't have a child. And the rabbi said, well, that's a good reason to, uh, to divorce. What's interesting, Bruce, is that with Hannah, she cries and she prays and her husband says, am I not enough for you? I love you so much. There's a beautiful, beautiful passage. But there are a lot of stories of couples that love each other, but they want the child so much that they can separate and the man can have a child. Excellent point. Yes, Don. Um, I'm always, I can't be unfascinated by the story of Abraham and Isaac. Um, and and Isaac was a gift from God, as we read mm -hmm. in the text. And um, Pastor Bruce can hold my feet to the fire on this, but it's there's a strong parallel between um, Christ as a gift from God and then being taken back. Yeah. Um, so that is an analogy. I remember, yes. I remember Kier Kierkegaard wrote so much on Abraham and Isaac. Yeah. And, and he could never really resolve, you know, he couldn't, he just couldn't resolve how God could take um, Isaac or how easily Abraham was willing to give up Isaac. Um, and um, so I guess what goes around comes around. <laughs> By the way, uh, I, I just want to point out that I, I also found that uh, in in uh, the uh, pre -Islam, Islam pre Islamic Arabs, uh, the sons would inherit the wives and concubines of the father. Okay, and it isn't until the Quran comes along that it's changed. Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, I, 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 so now, well, yeah, go, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. What uh, changed? The fact that they, the Koran prohibits that. Oh, that, okay. Okay. So I, I, there are other things, but, but we've spent, we've really dwelt a lot on this. Are there any other comments? So, here we have an example of another space, a big space in the Torah, in which the peh, okay, we, we don't like this behavior in, in any way. Uh, it, and we say, you know, I always remember my mother and grandmother doing this with saying peh, peh, peh. When somebody, when it, 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 it was a disgusting remark made. This is more than coveting. This is mo more than stealing. This is more than dishonoring. 
Okay, so you can see where a lot of these behaviors are going to lead to good outcomes. It's going to re be thought of as good commandments later on. So, you know, saying you shouldn't do any of this, it's disgusting. And so that's why I had the, the earlier statements about, well, maybe the story is going to go both ways because when we speak about it, we can talk about it, how bad it was, or what, as was mentioned, it can lead, we should dwell. I think it was Michael about dealing in the future that we should re remember the past, but we don't, we don't want to think about that as uh, an, a direct influence on our actions. It's the antithesis of that, that is going to, that these bad things are going to make us move forward. I think uh, Pastor Bruce, you said something about that too. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, if you wouldn't, uh, I, it, it's a Jewish Torah study, but there is one verse in the Brit Hadasha that really kind of fits this so well. And it's in the book of Romans. And it says, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. <laughs> and I know no. that you don't, you were not studying the New Testament or anything like that, but no, that but verse, it, it, it dovetails that into verse. it. It so does. That's right. Exactly. That's why we 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 like to bring in some other discussion periodically. Yeah. Because that verse just seemed to fit what you were saying. Sometimes somebody else has well, most of the time somebody else has said it in a better way than than the way I can express it or other people. Uh, and so yes, you have to give give that credit. So. Uh, it, it, but also, when we think in terms of science, there are bad events, there, there are things that are invented or discovered, and it depends on how we look at it, that we can use it for good or evil. And the same things that we say, the same things we do, the same things we farm. You take rhubarb. For example, simple plain rhubarb, a plant. It can be used as a poison, or you can you can you eat it if you prepare it a certain way. Strawberry rhubarb pie is my favorite. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so so we have so you have to understand that there's so many things in the world that have two ways of looking at it. We at think it's two ways. We think of mold being disgusting. It's going to make us sick. And yet, from that, we have antibiotics. Yeah, penicillin. And penicillin. Yeah, and others. And then it, that, that's right. So you, have, so you have to say it, to look for both sides. Maybe that's one of the lessons of this one, uh, this one verse that you have to be able to discuss it in a way that you see both sides. Then you are more apt to come to a, a healthier conclusion, a better conclusion. Yes, Gail. I, I think looking at something for, you know, both sides of a question is fine. But sometimes wrong is wrong and right is right. And that's what this is saying. And I think, I think particularly nowadays, we've kind of gone overboard with both sides of the question. Sometimes things just need to be said correctly, the truth. Yes, yes. However, if, 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 and sometime, if, if one of the rabbis would love to do this, is to have a session on what is truth. Because you can have truth based on faith, and you have no evidence to, so you can't use science to support that. You can have truth uh, based on science. But science is sub subject to change. That's what, what science is about. It's not something in the past. So you have to be careful and understand that it's only through discussion of, from both sides 
from a linear perspective or and a exponential dis- perspective that'll get you closer to a better understanding. That's all I'm going to say about that. Yes, go ahead, uh, Larry. Another way of saying it is referring to the philosopher Tevye on the one hand and then on the other hand. That's and right. That shows the wrestling of the ideas. Correct. Excellent point. Excellent point. So, so there's a lot that goes into this one, one verse. That's why, I, that's why I wanted to bring this out. And so uh, in my grandmother's tradition, uh, I'm just going to say we finished with this discussion that we are uh, disgusted with. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, so let's move on. And uh, if, so, if somebody would like to, uh, to pick up the reading, that would be fine. I, could I throw in one tagline here? If I, uh, FDR is famous for uh, trying to uh, hire a, a one-handed economist. <laughs> <laughs> a good one. Good one. Okay, so let's let's pick up where we left off. We're now going to discuss uh, verse. Uh, start pick up with verse twenty uh, three. Why don't we do that? Okay. Uh, well, we we, we can fig- uh, discuss the. Uh, um, uh, this is all part of it. Uh, One of the things we could discuss at another time is how does Israel come about to, you know, finding out about all of this? Okay, is it through, because it isn't stated as to how this comes about that he knows. And now let's say we can, if you want, we can discuss this further or we can uh, move on. To another to another topic. What what is your pleasure? Move on. And then nobody said anything, so I don't know which way you, you, want, you want to move you on. You decide. You decide. Okay. <laughs> so if we if we do it, it we'll take the second half. Uh, well, uh, well, the latter portion of verse 22. Now the sons of Jacob were 12 in number. Okay. And so if somebody wants to pick up with uh, reading verses 23 through uh, 26. Okay, David. Okay, thank you. Verse 23, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon and Levi, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, and the sons of Bilah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob that were born to him in Padam Aram. And any, Jacob, before we move on, any comments about that? Any what? Excuse me? I, I didn't comments? hear what you said, Marty. Oh, any comments about this? What was just read? Yeah, I have one. <laughs> okay, you, you do go first, then Rabbi Mir. Okay, I... Um, it, it's interesting that uh, Bill, Bill has son, one son is Dan. I don't know about Naphtali, but uh, the tribe of Dan later on uh, seems to get into a lot of trouble, like with idol worship and, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And um, so one has to wonder uh if if Dan wasn't influenced by Bilha in some way. I mean, we're looking at her in the respect that uh, oh poor Bilha, um Ruben uh, 
over, you know, seduced her or overpowered her or something like that. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it, you know, she, she might have been very pagan. I don't know. Well, what does, and also about Rachel. What what is the why is all of these in, in, oh, yeah, right. in rapid Rachel. fire? All yeah. of these discussions come in rapid fire uh, about idols, idol worshippers. Yes, you are correct. What does Rachel do with the idols? She she, she hides them. them. <laughs> she them. And why does she steal she the, them the idols? She steals them. She steals them, but why? Well, I think she was because she believes in her. Yeah, it, it's a symbol of power, also. Yes, yes, Rabbi Mary. Uh, I want to ask the group from all those names that were mentioned here, which one you knew before, you know before, you know. Okay, how many knew about Reuben? Simeon, okay, Levi, okay, uh, Judah, okay, how about Issachar, okay, okay. Rose, that's not fair. <laughs> I know, but, it, but he's still part of the group. Uh, uh, I, I, well, <laughs> okay. it's not fair, but... Um, that, that particular one is, there's a lot of wisdom associated with that name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the, idea, the idea that I wanted to share with you is uh, how do we call our people? What's the name of our people? Israel, Israelites. Israel is one, but there is another name. Judah, Judah, Judah. Judah, we are Yehudim. We are yeah. Jews. We are Yehudim. And he is number three. He is not number one. He is not number two. He is number three. So that's something to bear in mind that he and Benjamin have a very important role. Yes. Benjamin being the last son. The other one that we know is Levi. Anyone in the group is Cohen or Levi? Here. <laughs> Maybe well, you are a Levi. <laughs> Definitely. And we know that the people that their name are today, Katz, Katznovich, Cohen, Kahan, they are all descendants of the Levi's. And Levi, Levkovich, and Louis, and all those names. So that takes you to be a descendant, actually, in the genealogy that we're trying to find out. Those are the two that we can find. The others, we are very, very, uh, very, very uh, not real, know about them. But about Yehuda, I strongly recommend that we pay attention along the entire Torah about the issues of Yehuda and the issues of Reuben. Because yes. Reuben is no, no, no. And uh, this was one thing, and then it comes to another thing. So, uh, and Joseph, we all know because of the song, Joseph and the, uh, and the cap of many colors. But uh, regardless that Yehuda, number three, it's the name of our people, either the children of Israel or Yehudim. And in the world, they know more Jews, Jews, not the one we drink, I pronounce it the same. The Jews, the Yehudim come from Yehuda. So I think that we need to pay very close attention to the names of these guys, because they have a role later on in yes. our story. And the most important is Yehuda. And I won't tell you what happens, but okay. <laughs> it's really, really important that we remember that. 
As a matter of fact, the Torah goes into a lot of discussion about uh, certain traits that will show up later in, in as we look at the behavior of these sons as their tribe members will also have certain uh, traits, behavioral traits that are picked up in other stories. I think that's what Mary is getting after. Uh, and so it, it, become, it, it becomes important. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it always struck me if there's any single thread through the whole Bible that's the most important, it's bloodlines. You know, I mean, that, you know, who begot whom and, and all the way through. And in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, Pastor Bruce, again, but the, the entire New Testament hinges on the bloodline from David all the way through to Christ. Absolutely. Um, you, you can look very carefully at the lines in Matthew chapter one. It gives it, the, the records are completely agreeable with all Judaism in those records of Matthew. Yes. Right. And, you know, whatever redaction it might have taken by the scribes to get to that point, we'll never know. But, and it's probably true through all of the Hebrew Bible as well. You know, if, how much what was manipulated in order to preserve the bloodlines that are important. And you know, what we, what we know today about DNA is, does it, does it even matter today? You know? Mm. Uh, yeah. Interesting. You know, yeah. You know, does it, does it matter yeah. that, that one parent was connected to this child through a bloodline? I don't, I mean, I don't know. I'm just asking the question. It, it actually does. And if you read both of the, well, if you get into the, if you get into the first part there, with the DNA, you'll you'll actually see that way back, it wasn't just Joseph, it was Mary and Joseph that were a part of this line. And they used females as well as males in that, that bloodline, which is very unusual for a Jewish writer to use the female in the line. <laughs> very unusual. Yeah. Yes, Rabbi Mary. Um, you know, I think that we, I mean, this is what I give. As someone mentioned, I think it was Marty. There is belief, faith, and there is science. And, and they're built in different ways. Now, as I said before, uh, the Torah, Torah, not the rest, not the Tanakh, not comes uh, the prophets with Samuel, but the Torah was written in... Uh, it was written based on oral tradition. There was oral tradition and then it was written and then it was sealed. You don't add any more. Now the rabbis say, uh, Donald, that there is no beginning or end or continuation in the Torah. Something in the beginning, something goes there, Reuven is going to get it in two books and <laughs> things like that. So it's not a continuum. And history, history, that they could find something because history is based on either that what Suzanne brought, the, uh, the hidden, uh, what are they called? Those books that were found in Qumran that's either documents or archeology. span And for example, they didn't find any archeology span based on Moses and the Sinai and the walking and none of that. But it's, 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 it's a piece, it's a pillar of human being, the part of faith and taking it at, um, at value faith. So that's why I said it's not history. It's, let's remember, it's oral tradition that was written later on. And you know that there are several stories in the Torah, they, they, they appear twice. Why would they appear twice? The creation, there are two creations. Right. Why? Well, my friend, my partner said, well, the guys were sitting around the fire and Marty told the story of creation and then Donald told it that and they started 
you no, know, no, mine is the right. No, mine is. You know what? Let's put both. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to imagine how the process was about writing, which is so different than the writing uh, that we know today. And the only story, story, story that has a plot is Joseph's story because it starts and it continues and there is an end there. Mm -hmm. And I talk too much and I'll stop. Very, very well stated, uh, uh, Rabbi. Uh, I talk too much. No, you did, you did fine. You did fine. Any other comments at this point? Okay. Yeah, yes, uh, Michael, uh, please, and then Gail. Okay, I, I couldn't help but uh, think when Mary was speaking about uh, the the, uh, the Torah and in totality that uh, this writing is so unusual and astonishing because it, it was written and designed to be discussed over and over again. And the wording, the way everything is worded, it, uh, it, it commands that, that mm -hmm. it's just, uh, it's such a remarkable writing that, that uh, who could have written something like this? Where did this come from? You know, and so that would leave one's thinking and imagination to where could something like this have come from, this writing. And that's all I would uh, uh, say. For the time in which it was written, it's different, a, a totally different way of thinking about things. So yes, Michael, very important point. Yes, Gail, you had your hand. Yeah, I just I just wanted to add on what Mary was talking about having different, you know, a committee sitting down and trying to decide which version of, of the story to write, and they both end up having their bit put in. And that's why I keep referring back to this book called The Source, which shows you with different colored print, and this particular section that we've been studying this chapter 21 and 22 is a different source from the preceding uh, verses and the following verses it's like an insert which makes it even more interesting <laughs> you know one of, I, I i i just wanted to say that uh uh it, it, this just popped into my mind while while you were speaking gail and uh, uh all of these stories that we're involved in right now, uh, are there has to be a purpose for it. Jacob has risen, okay, in our minds to be a very important character in the story. And all of a sudden, everything is being cut from under him. Okay, we're about to read uh, another story in just verses 27 through 29 that is going to be another aspect in his life that is cut from under him. And it's going to, and uh, you, you see the uh, so the grandeur that he has getting to this pinnacle of being free from Laban. And now there's a series of deaths and a series of changes uh, and other events that, uh, that if, if we think about it a little bit, most of us, when we go through a, a period of time, one bad thing happening after another, we start to say, why me? What's happening? I, I, you know, here, I, I was really great. 
And now, even if you will, his father is going to die. I mean, this is everyone. He's learned about his mother's death. He's learned about now he is going to get together. And his father died. One of his daughters had been raped. One of his sons has committed a, a sinful act. And, but all of these deal with loss in different ways. And we've covered a lot of the different ways that he's losing. Uh, he, he's, he's in, in, he, he is being, his, his, way, his reason for doing things is being threatened. And one by one, each thing is, uh, it seems like a failure of his character. And we're going to see his character come up again and again. And each time it comes up, it's his old Jacob self. So we're going to read this uh, and we're, and we don't, and, and Jacob, when he, when he does something that's good and, and God is with him, it's Israel. And when it's, it's bad stuff and he collapses again into the why me, he becomes Jacob again. So, it, it, so it's an interesting twist in, on things, but why don't we read verses 27 through 29. So, so I, I had to preface this. So why don't we, why don't we talk about, uh, 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 read those and then we'll explore this a little bit. So who would like to read? Go ahead, Suzanne. Uh, And Jacob came unto Isaac, his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were a hundred and fourscore years. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days, and his son Esau and Jacob buried him. Okay. I have that Isaac was 180 years old, 40 and 40, right? Yeah, four oh, school. It okay. says the same thing. <laughs> but any any discussion here? Well, Jacob has had another loss. What else? Well, the, he, it seems like he was at the same place uh, where Abraham and Isaac went when... Uh, with the um, where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac nearby, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. There's something about about there's this. Something about that, yeah. Okay, Isaac is. Uh, there's a well that Isaac has dug. It's the third well. Okay, it's in the Isaac story too, uh, and uh, but. Anything else? They remember they uh, Isaac the story between uh, 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 Jacob and Esau when they meet again. Mm-hmm. Okay, and Jacob decides. Okay, I'm not going to follow because I'm not sure what Esau is going to do. I'm not 100 percent sure that he has made up with me. And I'll stay in, on the periphery while, uh, instead of going to my father. The rabbis have had a, a, uh, a, um, a great discussion about this in, in certain commentaries that Esau was more of a son to Isaac during this time because he was there already taking care of Isaac in his last days. I don't know, but I'm saying, you know, we could discuss that or we could just say, okay, the two brothers got together to to, uh, bury their father. 
okay? But Esau has also been living in the land. You remember, you remember uh, uh, what does Jacob do when he suddenly realizes he, uh, he uh, gave the blessing uh, to, uh, to uh, his second-born son? Yeah, cool. To Yaakov, to Jacob. So what does he do with regard to Esau? He sort of makes up for it. You shall have the land. You shall have your, your, your progeny. You'll have numerous progeny. You, you do all these things. Okay. But is it God who's saying that? Or is it Jacob? Hmm. Yeah. Excuse me, Larry. I thought you were saying something. I have a comment on something else. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, please. Oh, uh, Bruce, uh, Pastor Bruce had to leave. Okay, and uh, okay, that uh, he was giving uh, the, the uh, things. Yes, Rabbi Mary. Well, I think that if we remember. The two guys that are not con that are connected but disconnected come to bury their father are Isaac, Isaac, and Ismael. They never were together anywhere, as only to bury Abraham, right. their father, common father. And here we see the same thing. Right. We see Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. And Estav, Estav, coming together, regardless of the fact that they were not very close together during their lives. And there was a, I mean, I know that they, they uh, hug each other and so forth, but basically they were separated and they come together to bury the father. I think it's an interesting thing. I didn't think about that before. Yeah, this is it. It, it, it is a um, uh, a a very I think important realization that okay they've made up and now they come together in peace to to uh, bury the, the their father. What else? Do, yes, uh, Larry, you were going. I'd to... like to get back to Gail's comment oh, that sure. in twenty one and twenty two. Um, it's y uh, Israel, and it's the Yahwist um, authors. In 23 to 29, it's the priestly version. And what are their points of view, agendas that are different? Because 23, we do Yaakov, not Israel. You mentioned um, a different personality aspect um, with the name change but also it's an author change. And what's the significance? Okay, I don't know the significance of having, including the two authors. Does, does your resource address that? I don't know, would Gail have info? Should we be making notes of which group authors do the different sections. Oh, good heck. If we did that, you'd have check marks all over everything. Okay. I need to, when we start meeting together again, then I can bring the book and you can, you know, visibly see it. There'll be whole sections, you know, verse right. after verse after verse by the same author. And then suddenly there's these odd little inserts. And what's interesting is if you read only and, and I say they're color coded. Say you're reading the blue story and you skip over everything else and go to the next section that's blue. It's a continuous story. But when you go back and you read each section from different colors inserted, it gives you a whole different feel. It's really fascinating. I, I, I don't find it a negative thing at all. I find it really interesting. This has been a discussion we have had before. If you go um, uh, and and look up the Targum Jonathan, Jonathan, 
he was, cons- uh, it'll come up in, in a lot of the commentaries. He was, he was Greek, but he converted to Judaism and he uh, became a uh, scholar. He was felt uh, of his day uh, that dealt with Torah. And it was realized in um, uh, around the year 7 AD, this is, and this I get from my, uh, from, uh, my Jewish learning, okay, uh, that there was basically a convention because the, the Torah had been translated into multiple languages, including Greek, and including uh, eight different Aramaic languages, each with a different in slightly wording. And so by convention, what we read today in Torah is what came out of 7 AD. And so we have to realize that if this is the case, then there may be, that may be why we have diff- these different versions were included because they say, well, this story leaves something out that's very important, but, may- but if we eliminate that entire story, we miss something else. I don't know, I, 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 none of us were there, but uh, because of that, uh, uh, because of that, it has led to what uh, other religions say that we that what we read is not valid. They say it's it's been added to uh, that you had d- total different versions that were condensed into one book, and it's used as a negative, but not really. No. It, it, so, so it, uh, it, if you think about it, by having th- these juxtaposition of, of, of the way the, the, the situation was interpreted, it becomes very human. Oh, yeah. This is, this is what I'm saying. It's not a negative thing. And so many people right. criticize and say, oh, that's a terrible thing to say. It's not one, you know, writer of the whole thing. But this, it's really, it's absolutely fascinating. I, I really wish more people would buy the book so they could see this and understand more of what they're reading because it's, it just explains so much. Yeah, I, I happen to agree with you, Gail. Sure. Yes, Rabbi Mary. Well, uh, the first translation from Hebrew Torah to another language was Greek. Mm-hmm. The seven people, I think that they're called Septu, I don't know, I don't remember the word. Septuagint. Uh, it's Excuse Septuagint. Me? There you are, uh, what Suzanne said. <laughs> and it was in Greek. And later on, it was translated in other languages. Uh, for the Western languages, it was after the creation of uh, uh, the print. But I'm going to throw something else inside this, not just the oral Torah, but a lot of the stories that we read in the Torah come from other traditions that existed before us, during us. Hammurabi is one of those that are just amazing, you know? You see the, the, the commandments that he had and the commandments that we have how much connected they are. So the issue, Marty, that you talk about translations, I absolutely agree with you regarding the translations, not regarding the Hebrew. Uh, As I said, the Hebrew was spoken. And, and, you know, we know in English there is a difference, and Donald can correct me, between the spoken word and the written word. You know, we don't do f f f in the written world, and we don't say the F word and the S word and all kinds of stuff. So we have that kind, the one that wrote it down said, well, it's not very nice to say the S word. So let's say, or the F word. Yeah. So let's say fudge. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to do those changes. So uh, anyway, I, I think that reading the, his, the history of the creation of the Torah, not the history that's in the story, 
then it, it enriches us a lot. And, you know, and we feel that we are not such a special people that invented all kinds of things. And then there is Midrash that the Torah preceded God because God uses the Torah to uh, set things in motion. <laughs> so take your pick. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Don. Yeah, thank you for that, um, Rabbi Mary. Um, more and more, I, I'm appreciating how much of a, a, a craft of art the Torah really is and the effort it took to put it all together. Because in between these sessions, I start to drill down and, and buy in other books that I can find secondhand. And I'm just reading this one, um, The Day of Yahweh. And it's almost 600 pages um, <laughs> on the, and half of it is footnotes, fine footnotes um, on how the sacred days and ritual forms throughout the Bible are all woven together and what it took to line all these calendars up, you know, the lunar calendar, the solar calendar, the, um, which days are sacred, which ones are lucky, which ones are unlucky, which, which, you know, I, I've been reading this book now for a month and I'm still only halfway through. Um, but what it does is it, it just emphasizes that these stories, yeah, they're very instructive stories, um, but the, the overall structure of the Torah is, is you know, greater than any, um, cathedral. It's, it's, um, Interesting. Yes, yes, Rabbi. Thank you, Don, for that. Yes. I, I just want to introduce one word, and all of you who know history, please correct me. I really in school didn't like history, so I didn't listen too much. But I think that our people introduce the idea of one God. Yes. That's a, that's a very important change on the, the other little gods that existed and so forth. Uh, that I think that I know about it, but correct me if I'm not, I'll be very happy. No, I think I think you're 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 very you're right on in that uh, concept. As a matter of fact, uh, there has. It is, there is a pharaoh that also believed in monotheism. Uh, uh, I, but I forget the name and uh, it, it sometimes comes up in literature and like that. Y yes, Larry. Are we more monolatry than monotheistic in that we understand that there are other gods, but one God is greater than the other gods? There's another concept here that in, in when if you recognize there are other gods out there, right. our God is also in here. Ah. Okay, it's it, 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 there's a difference because it, 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 you're worshiping idols and it's all out there. Okay, you the Greeks were worshiping gods, yeah, they had a concept of up there and you know in but they were they were out there doing just here it's in in our religion it's within yeah it's uh, out there michael and um what was i gonna say i forget um everywhere out there and everywhere yes i see it differently out there and everywhere if it's within you, it's everywhere. Correct. Good point. Good point. Because uh, it, it's the way you perceive everything then. And you're looking at things, if you think about it, if you think about it, one way that uh, this discussion could go is that if you uh, see the world as good you will be more likely to come up with solutions that are good, that are better than not good. Uh, and, uh, and that if you see the world 
not as a gift, but it, as, oh, it's just there and everything is happenstance. As you do hear from a lot of athe atheists today and over the years, uh, you start, uh, it, then you have to question, does life have meaning? This is part of the book I, I was, I'm reading right now, The Great Partnership. It deals with science and religion. And you, he's, as I mentioned earlier, uh, <coughs> before, uh, Rabbi Sachs says, you need a little of both. You need truth from science and you need truth from philosophy or religion. And, and it's a combination of the two that will let, allow you to move forward better. If you just stay linear, you lose the overall concept. And if you stay conceptual, you lose a lot of the detail. And so it becomes, it, it's an interesting way of looking at things. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, uh, this is being recognized in Torah both the linear as well as the conceptual. And we're asked to, to, to when we're talking about uh, being chosen, maybe it's chosen that we're given freedom to, uh, to choose the right thing to do. It doesn't always have to be the wrong thing to do. I'm going to, I don't know if we will have enough time we, to continue this, but what, what we're going to be reading uh, is uh, when we talk about uh, Esau and Ed Edom, okay, there's a lot given and much more, it seems like there's a lot more prosperity he has a huge family. Here, we're in, what we're going to do is read uh, about Esau. In, we, we spend two uh, uh, verses discussing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the family, the clans, the tribes, and for the discussion about Esau it's going to take 43 verses. So he has a lot more progeny. He's going to have a lot more progeny. And he's going to have a lot of land. He's going to have this land around Seir. And the vegetation is such that he's going to be able to have not only a huge family, but also huge livestock, huge, not, huge numbers of livestock that are all going to depend on being able to grow food and livestock to feed all of that family. Okay, he's very wealthy in this regard. But his concept of the land is going to be far different from what God intends for the uh, for Jacob and Joseph and the Israelites, and what God because it's going to come out in this whole section in in all of thirty six uh, chapter thirty six that okay you can be a man of the land and use the land but there is no commentary about God in what we're going to be reading. And I think that that's another distinction to be made between what is being granted. We're going to see he, uh, that uh, Esau is, is fruitful, multiplies. He has great wealth, all tangible things. But something that, that is going to be nagging in the back of our mind is that Jacob, in converting him to Israel, God is saying, you now have 
more of a responsibility, not only to your people, but to me. Yes, Michael. Yeah, I want to go back a few minutes, if I may, just for a moment. We were talking about uh, God is out there or within me, everywhere. And, I, and it's very, it reminds me of the, uh, the prayer, the song, Adon Olam. Mm -hmm. And that is at the end, in some of the, uh, the way it's written in some of the different books, it says, God is with me, I have no fear. Correct. See, I kind of thought it, I connected that, and I thought that might be interesting. It is. It is very interesting. Very well put. So th this is, uh, so I know the discussion will, will be rather long. I sort of am framing some of the discussion now, but you may have other ideas that come into your mind as we enter into the discussion about uh, uh, Esau and Edom, the Edomites, and, and everything that we're going to have to contend with, as Don put it in other books, uh, uh, in, in future reading, uh, it, it's going to be a, a very interesting thing. I, I, I think this is a good place to stop because I don't think, you know, we can pick up uh, on this uh, uh, because I know we'll have lots of discussion ab about this as well. And I, I, we really took this apart today. We really did. And I appreciate everyone, at, at their ideas and comments on this. And if anybody has other ideas that we didn't cover, please j just mention them now. Otherwise, I don't know if we have any announcements. Um, I, I have one. I know the rabbi couldn't be with us today, but we may have some uh, additional members from a temple in uh, Tempe, Arizona. The rabbi has been doing some work there with a, a rabbi and, a, and helping the congregation there. Uh, and when, and uh, the rabbi up in Tempe is going to uh, be busy with uh, a lot of bar and bat mitzvahs on Saturdays but he thinks that the Torah study would be worthwhile for his congregation because they don't have as many religious services as they do. Uh, they're more into ritual type, types of things, uh, but uh, he feels that some of them would appreciate joining our group. And so the rabbi is going to be in touch with the rabbi up in Tempe and uh, so we may see some new faces in the weeks to come. We'll see. We'll see how things go. Absolutely. So I just wanted to let everyone know what's, what's going on there. I, I, I thought I saw a hand up. Uh, Rabbi Mary, were you going to say something? Or Gail? Maybe I, it was something else. Okay. No. Okay. Okay, but uh, I just thought it, it'll be it'll be interesting because the more input we get from all different backgrounds, the more dis discussion time will be it, it will take place. I'm sure of that. Everyone, be safe and be well, please. Uh, yes, please. Marty, please. thank you so much for leading this great discussion today. <laughs> thank you, again. and all the others. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, but, thank you but it's all really for giving what, me this opportunity. And I apologize if I talk too much. You should just disconnect me, and that no, no, no. <laughs> but it, it, no, it, never, never, it, never. It, it, I, I, because it is more important to have everyone's opinion about things because then it sparks another idea, and this is the way we started. Yeah, Marty. Today, with what was read, it, different people read different things. And our discussion about pet, the mouth, and how important it is what we speak. Yes, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I wanted to say something, but I, I want to first ask you, how is Susan? She's doing well, thank you. I, she, she uses uh, Saturday mornings to replenish herself. 
And uh, I cannot, I know she would have a ball if she participated, uh, but uh, she relies on my uh, commentary on, based on what each of you have said. Uh, and she, she enjoys that. Uh, but maybe the thought just entered my mind is, I'm not gonna tell her. She has to attend. <laughs> you know, when you talked about uh, the and the mouth, yes, uh, I, I would suggest that um, um, may, maybe it's just the, like subliminal, but you could get a, an education, I believe, on that by watching, if you do, cable news, because these people are really good at that. They're very, very, very good. And regardless of what they're talking about, they, uh, they're, they're very penetrating, the way they use their mouth and their speech. Yes. And, yes. and, and unfortunately, a lot of people, they could uh, uh, get to a lot of people that way, one way or the other, one way or the yeah, other, yeah. not saying anything. This, but, is, this is very true, Michael, very true. Uh, it, it is, uh, again, something that uh, we have been given a very profound advancement for whatever it is in our, in our ability to think, our cortex. It's, as far as we know, it is very advanced. Okay, we can talk about whales and dolphins too and all this, but... Uh, but from the standpoint of things, our, it, when we use our cortex rather than our midbrain to do our thinking, then I think we come further. Uh, and that's what we're, we're getting after here. Uh, don't, don't we allow, in certain instances, other people allow other people to do our thinking? depending on the person. That's why I don't call the, uh, the, what you said about news reporting on cable, it's all commentary reporting. It's not news, it's editorial, it's editorial. And you see this constantly. Uh, you get snippets of the news, maybe every hour, every other hour in a five minute break. But really, you're, 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 you have to go to multiple sources to really come to a better understanding of what's being said in the commentary, not necessarily the news. Right. It's, it's well, got to get away from indoctrination. Well, this happens with everybody. Uh, there's a big difference. It, and, and unfortunately... Uh, you, you raised a very important subject in my mind. My grandson wants to become a journalist and he is going through uh, 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 a challenge. How do you separate the facts, who, what, when, where, and how, and why, from commentary, uh, the editorial page, what we had traditionally, Today it's different, but you see this no matter who you, no matter what source you use today. There's a uh, there's a lot of editorializing in everything we say and do, and uh, but it's nothing new. I I would have to disagree with you on some of this, Mark, please, because please. a lot of what you see on cable, and I'm just going back a week. Mm -hmm. Wednesday, I watched that from the very beginning until almost 1030 at night to make sure the Congress was back in section. There was no commentary. That was all live. And telling you it was terrifying. I don't need commentary for that. That was live. Agreed. Totally agree. When you see when and that is the benefit of having cable from that standpoint, if we're going to talk about that. But it, why don't we see it 
for ourselves without the commentary? Well, there wasn't much, there wasn't any commentary. Most of that that well, day was very you, very little. They were showing live action. I mean, yes. I watched the whole yes. thing. Yes, and that and it didn't need commentary, as you're saying. I agree with you a hundred percent, but you still have the input from commentators and you have to be careful to separate that out. They may agree with what you, you've seen, but the commentators can lead you astray. I don't have a problem with them. I don't have a problem with intelligent commentary and uh, I can listen to it for hours at a time if, if, if it's good and if it's intelligent. And uh, so I, I, but I think um, Marty and Michael are making very good points and uh, sort of saying that the time we're spending is not wasted, but it is very good if the in commentary is intelligent. And, it's, and, and if it's not double standard, double standard commentary, that's also has to be considered. Well, now you're getting into a, another type of discussion. Yeah. But, it, but we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. What Gail and, and David were talking about, very important. Uh, the reason I bring in the other commentaries, like I did today, some of them are not discussed traditionally. Okay, but what we did was we, we discussed it from multiple sources. And, the, and we came, as I always say, when we do this, you can latch on to one or the other, but it's another source. And it, it's what is going to appeal to you as an individual. And that's okay. It's not, we're not saying if one is better than the other, we're not saying, it, but if you take it from the traditional rabbinical standpoint, what we did today is pet. <laughs> we wouldn't be discussing it at all. Okay. I want to thank um, the Torah study for giving us a discipline, a way of evaluating concepts, ideas, and Judaism for instilling a sense of morality, morality. and values. Right. And we need to have an anchor, um, our own internal way of evaluating events and putting it in a context. Yes. And that's why um, our discussions are so important. Always. Yes, Don. Uh, two quick things. With regard to the news, we have to remember that almost all of it is commercially sponsored. So that's where the, so it, that influence is always there on sure. yeah. NPR or something. But, and um, with regard to this group, I just want to say that I, I learned things by hearing you all. And so please keep talking. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think it's important because uh, a lot of times, if, if you only hear one side of it that you agree with, you will not know that there's another opinion out there. And, it, and that opinion may or may not be important enough to change someone's thinking. You never know, you never know. It may give them a little softening of their position. A little, oh, there's something else out there that I didn't realize that people were thinking about or talking about, or somebody in the remote past has said. And that I think is the purpose of an education is to say, recognize that, but, but in no way I, am I saying that if something is bad or harmful, are we to take that as, as a good, you know, a good topic to, to latch on to? I would never want to do that. Yes, David. Yeah, well, the, I agree with what you're saying about education. And Stephen Leacock always did like to did love to define an education as 10 sheets of full scap or legal sized paper. And, uh, but I, 
but I think we can go a little bit further than that. Also, Wendy and I really enjoy all of these comments, especially Miri's. I mean, uh, the Rabbi Miri's is yes. really very, adds so much extra to what we're doing in such another dimension that we both really love hearing from you, Rabbi Miri. I, we all do, yeah. Yeah, Marty. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> yes, yes, Michael. Yeah, um, you know, many times I would hear people say, I don't want to discuss politics or religion. I hear that quite often. However, I don't, we are discussing for the most part religion. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that politics can ever be discussed in 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 the uh, in a in a, uh, a, re a a reasonable way the way we are discussing religion I just I just can't I would it would be wonderful if it, if it's if it's possible but I don't think so because it's so charged what I think you need to do is to possibly read the the papers uh, by the founding fathers yeah. and how much yeah. they disagreed. Uh, for the United States, how much they disagreed and how, but they had one thing that overrode their disagreement. And I hate to say it, but it was the Bible. They, they had all had that and they had, they knew they had to compromise. But everything that we, we talk about, uh, if you, if, if you talk about uh, uh, the words, they, they, it's all couched in terms of the Old Testament, the New Testament. Uh, they, they were very religious people in their own way. And uh, they re each re came from a different state. A lot of us have forgotten that each state represented a different religious sect in England. Hmm. But this, this discussion we're having is entirely civil. Yes, it can be done, recognizing yeah. their other opinions. That's right. The, and the other opinion, the other opinions are discussed. They're not argued, really, but they're discussed. Well, they were argued, and some of those... I'm referring to us. Yeah, but okay. But back then, some of those topics were not resolved. It led to the Civil War. And it's still not resolved in some people's minds. Marty, I just, I have to go, but I want to put in one more. Sure, uh, please. I want to comment on what David said about Mary. Let me tell you, I'm sorry you weren't privileged to attend when she was teaching our classes every Saturday at the temple for many, many years. I still look back so fondly on that time, Mary, and I miss you so much. <laughs> yes, I do too. Uh, because I have, to go, guys. Sorry. I have to admit this, that a lot of the, the methods that I use in teaching were uh, observing Rabbi Mary. No. No. Oh, those of oh, you guys, who... I'm completely fat clumped. Well, that's okay. You deserve it. You deserve it. I have to go. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for continuing having this in those in these difficult times. Yes. Okay. Well, everyone, have a great sh uh, uh, Shabbat now and uh, uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat. Thanks, Marty. You're welcome. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Next week. <laughs>